I'm Melanie Brooks. I am an assistant professor of marketing at Columbia Business School, and I am the lead author on this paper. And I'm Jonathan Lavav. I'm a professor of marketing at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, and I'm a co-author on this paper. We heard from executives and managers that they were having a hard time with innovation in the remote teams. I had a friend who was a very prominent Silicon Valley CEO who said, um, you know, to develop new products, your engineers have to be co-located. And so it was that comment plus some other comments that we'd heard that sort of got the ball rolling on this idea. So initially we wanted to hold everything constant because there's lots of differences between remote teams and in-person teams. Um, like they're in different time zones, they might have different office cultures. So we brought people into the lab, they actually met each other first, and then we randomly assigned them to either be in the same physical space, in the same lab room, or in two identical lab rooms interacting with a 15-inch display of their partner's face in front of them. And we had them do two different tasks. So they participated in idea generation for five minutes, coming up with new ideas. And then they had one minute to select their most creative idea. So we could look at the generative process of coming up with new ideas and the evaluative process. So we found that being in the same physical space affected both idea generation and maybe idea evaluation. So people who were in the same physical space in the same room sitting across from each other generated a larger number of creative ideas um, than people who were sitting in separate rooms communicating um, on video. But when it came to idea evaluation, we find, if anything, people who are interacting separately were better at identifying their top, most creative idea compared to people who are interacting face-to-face. -face. People that worked face-to-face -face generated ideas that were more dissimilar to each other than people that worked over Zoom. What's really important to understand is hybrid is here to stay. I don't think the question is, are we going to always be working remotely or do we need to be in person? But instead, it's how do we strategically decide what things we do when we're in the same place and what things can we allocate to when we're working remotely? And I think this is just the first step in deciding you know, what these tasks are. And I think that some of the passion that people have about working from home comes from the fact that they hate commuting. The reaction to that shouldn't be saying, okay, everybody now, everybody work from home, but instead say, okay, how can I make the physical workplace be a higher value place for people that makes a commute worthwhile? So what we would suggest is when you're in person, it makes sense to prioritize doing the more generative, expansive thinking that involves that's involved with idea generation. Um, but when you're working remotely, you might even be better at things like evaluation and deciding you know, which steps to take next. It doesn't make sense to structure the workplace around days of the week and number of days of the week that you're around versus not around the office, but really think about tasks and, and design your, your schedule around, the, around which, which environment is best suited for a specific task. Build the work week around the tasks that need to be completed um, rather than around some arbitrary rule about days of the week um, that the people have to be around or not have to be around. This is not something you can just learn away or adapt away. This is, this is something fundamental about the human experience of consuming information through technology. You know, as long as technology has screens and those screens create a, a limited shared environment, then you should see effects like ours. Our data doesn't have an agenda. Um, we came in wanting to find empirical yes. support to see are there differences between the cognitive processes we engage in when we're in person and when we're virtual. We're not looking to support a particular policy. We're looking for empirical data for psychological processes. And this is just one more data point to go into what I hope will be an intentional process of deciding what these policies will be. The paper is called Virtual Communication Curbs Creative Idea Generation. And you can find it at nature.com. See you later, Jonathan. Bye now.